bit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. You are going to hear a conversation about renting an apartment. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Before we start the test, look at the example of your question booklet and listen to the tape. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. In the tape, the man says he is interested in renting an apartment in your building. Therefore, the word apartment has been written down. Now, we will play the recording. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. How can I help you, sir? Hi, I'm interested in renting an apartment in your building. Can you show me around inside? Sure, my pleasure. Do you know what kind of apartment you're looking for? I'm thinking of something for my best friend and I. The apartment doesn't have to be too big, just something comfortable for the two of us. I'm looking for a kitchen, two bedrooms and a bathroom, just something simple. OK, well, let me show you what we have to offer. We divide our apartments into three categories. There are standard apartments, upgraded standard apartments and luxury apartments. Please follow me. This apartment just went up for rent yesterday. The old tenants moved into a larger one. This apartment is what I call the standard apartment. It's small, but has everything you need. The kitchen comes with a refrigerator, an oven and a stove. There is one bathroom with a shower, but no bathtub. The rooms are a good size and both have their own closets. The living room has enough space for a couch. We will provide a television for you. These apartments are very popular with students because they are affordable and practical. Right now, we are renting these out for only $1,000 a month. I think this is a little bit on the small side. There's no space for a dining table or even for an extra desk. We will both need room to study. If there are guests over, we hope to be able to have a dining table big enough for at least four people. Do you have anything slightly larger? Maybe just an apartment with a bigger living room? Well, let's take a look. Right now, we also have an opening for a luxury apartment. This apartment is larger. It has three bedrooms, and all three are larger than the last one. And there are two bathrooms, and all have bathtubs. The kitchen is also larger, and come with an additional dishwasher and freezer. The living space has plenty of space for a dining room. How much is the rent on these apartments? These are more expensive, usually in the $2,500 range. Don't forget that there is an, an additional bedroom, so you could find another roommate to lower the cost. Hmm, I think that's a little bit on the expensive side. We don't really have the time to find another roommate, so it's probably better to stick with the two bedroom places. Is there anything between these two? Come with me. I can show you this apartment right now, but there are people living in it. There are no more of these kinds of apartments available at this moment, but if you decide that you like it, I can put you on the waiting list, and as soon as we have openings, you will be contacted. Sure, let's take a look. This is the upgraded standard apartment. As you can see, it's larger than the other two bedroom apartment. There are two bedrooms and two bathrooms, one in each room. The living room comes with a television, but no furniture. The kitchen is around the same size as the other smaller apartment. The basic difference is the additional bathroom and larger living room. These rent for around $1,400. Now look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. Seems like a good deal. Do you know when an apartment like this will be available? That's hard to say. I know these people who live here right now should be graduating soon, so they might be moving out. Well, I guess I'll put my name on the waiting list. Hopefully there'll be an opening as soon as possible. That sounds like a good plan. I will notify you as soon as we have vacancies. You will have to leave us some information and a student identification number. Sure, no problem. My full name is Robert Jack Browning. Could I have your age, please? I'm 38. Your major? I'm studying biology. How about naming some of your hobbies? Hmm, fishing, golf, watching movies and spending time with my family. Sounds like a good life. What is the price range of the apartment you are looking for? Somewhere between $1,000 to $1,500. Your student identification number, please? QS45890. Could you repeat that? QS45890. Lastly, could you leave us a phone number? OK. It's area code 236-580-2287. Thank you very much. I will give you a call as soon as possible. That is the end of part one. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You will hear an extract from a radio program about a famous bridge. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 18. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 18. The Sydney Harbour Bridge is nearly three quarters of a century old and to help celebrate this important occasion, our reporter Sarah Chambers has compiled this brief history of her favourite bridge. A bridge is more than just a crossing over a river or a waterway. It is a landmark in its own right a landmark which allows us to identify one city from another. Think, for instance, of the Bridge of Sighs in Venice or the magnificent Charles Bridge in Prague. Each of these cities can be recognised by their famous bridges. The Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco is another example of a city known by its bridge. But in addition to this, a bridge is a kind of ornament for a city, similar, if you like, to a cathedral or a palace. Here in Sydney, we may not have our own palace, but we do have our famous and much-loved bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, which is sometimes affectionately known as the Coat Hanger because of its arched shape. It was built back in the 1930s, and so the bridge is coming up for a significant birthday. Let's have a little look at its history. Although the idea of building a crossing over Sydney Harbour had been discussed many years earlier, it wasn't until the year 1916 that the state government agreed to allocate some money for the construction of a bridge. The chief engineer for the bridge was a man called Dr John Bradfield, a brilliant engineer who supervised the entire project from beginning to end. First, they had to decide on a design. So he organised an international competition to choose a design and ultimately got the one he wanted. The job went to a British engineering firm 
and the contract was signed in 1924. The design he chose was the single arch bridge that you see today, made of steel with a tower at either end. In 1926, construction finally began. The first thing they had to do was demolish 800 houses around the site where the towers were to be built. The poor families, however, never received any compensation for this. But the project created thousands of jobs, much needed in those difficult times. Of course, like all projects of this size, it took much longer to build than originally planned. It was supposed to have been finished by 1930, but actually it wasn't completed for another two years. It also cost twice as much as the original quote, coming in at £9.5 million instead of the agreed contract price of £4.2 million. But what's new? <laughs> the opening ceremony took place on the 19th of March, 1932, and a large crowd gathered for the occasion. The Premier of the state was just about to cut the ribbon when suddenly a man rode through the crowd mounted on a horse and slashed the ribbon with his sword. He wanted to be the first to cut the ribbon. Anyway, they tied the ribbon back together and the ceremony continued. The man on the horse was fined five pounds for his offensive behaviour. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 19 and 20. Now listen and answer questions 19 and 20. Since then, millions of cars have crossed the bridge, each paying a toll to do so. By the early 1980s, the government had paid off the loan for the money they'd borrowed all those years before. But motorists continued to pay to cross from north to south. This money was subsequently used to build a tunnel under the harbour to reduce the amount of traffic on the bridge. The tunnel was opened in 1992 and cost $544 million. It is 2.3 kilometres long and is equipped with all the latest technology, including closed-circuit television to monitor any problems. And it has most definitely reduced the load on the bridge as it carries around 75,000 vehicles each day, which would otherwise have to use the bridge and it's apparently strong enough to withstand the impact of a ship or even the impact of an earthquake. The tunnel has been a welcome solution to Sydney's traffic problems, but of course, a tunnel could never compete with a bridge as a landmark for any city. So let's wish the bridge a very happy birthday. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, 
Yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course.、Mm. So science and ethics, there's a lot of reading and research to do, and I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I see. We have to do assignments, and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language.、Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh, I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do.、Mm-hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently. They send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point.、Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing.、Mm. So it's got a very practical application.、Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have thirty seconds to read questions twenty-four to thirty. So let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh goodness! If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh no, that's not fair.、Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No, this maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Ah,、oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh, <laughs> mind you, the one on this course should make sense because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not.、Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have, like what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, okay. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it.、Oh, I think you'll be okay. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. No,、oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh, I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary though. <laughs> well. It shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs,、oh. spread the load, as it were. <laughs>、oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on then? Let me look.、Um, ah, it says that we have an interview, and we get a mark for the whole course depending on how well we do in that. Oh right. Okay. So. I-
That is the end of part 3. Now turns to part 4. You will hear a postgraduate psychology student talking to other students about a job satisfaction study he has investigated. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning, everyone. For my presentation today, I'm going to report on an assignment that I did recently. My brief was to analyze the methods used in a small study about job satisfaction and then to make recommendations for future studies of a similar kind. The study that I looked at had investigated the relationship between differences in gender and differences in working hours and levels of job satisfaction amongst workers. For this purpose, employees at a call center had been asked to complete a questionnaire about their work. I'll summarize the findings of that study briefly now. First of all, female full-time workers reported slightly higher levels of job satisfaction than male full-time workers. Secondly, female part-time workers reported slightly higher levels of satisfaction than female full-time ones did. On the other hand, male part-time workers experienced slightly less job satisfaction than male full-time workers. But although these results seemed interesting and capable of being explained, Perhaps the most important thing to mention here is that in statistical terms, they were inconclusive. Personally, I was surprised that the findings hadn't been more definite, because I would have expected to find that men and women, as well as full and part-time workers, would experience different levels of satisfaction. So I then looked more carefully at the methodology employed by the researchers, to see where there may have been problems. This is what I found. First of all, the size of the sample was probably too small. The overall total of workers who took part in the survey was 223, which sounds quite a lot, but they had to be divided up into subgroups. Also, the numbers in the different subgroups were unequal. For example, there were 154 workers in the full-time group, but only 69 in the part-time group. And amongst this part-time group, only 10 were male, compared to 59 who were female. Secondly, although quite a large number of people had been asked to take part in the survey, the response was disappointingly low. A lot of them just ignored the invitation. And workers who did respond may have differed in important respects from those who didn't. Thirdly, as the questionnaires had been posted to the call center for distribution, the researchers had had very limited control over the conditions in which participants completed them. For instance, their responses to questions may have been influenced by the views of their colleagues. All these problems may have biased the results. In the last part of my assignment, I made recommendations for a similar study, attempting to remove the problems that I've just mentioned. 
Firstly, a much larger sample should be targeted, and care should be taken to ensure that equal numbers of both genders and both full and part-time workers are surveyed. Secondly, the researchers should ensure that they are present to administer the questionnaires to the workers themselves. And should they require the workers to complete the questionnaire under supervised conditions so that the possibility of influence from other colleagues is eliminated? Finally, as workers may be unwilling to provide details of their job satisfaction when they are on work premises, it's important that the researchers reassure them that their responses will remain confidential and also that they have the right to withdraw from the study at any time if they want to. By taking measures like these, the reliability of the responses to the questionnaires is likely to be increased, and any comparisons that are made are likely to be more valid. So, that was a summary of my assignment. Does anyone have any questions? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.